401. It's 401, so let's get started. Uh, welcome, Jackie. Uh, if you could mute for now, and we'll introduce the panelists later in the webinar, that would be great. Thank you. Uh, so welcome, everyone, to today's webinar. My name is Sean Wei Sun, and I am a senior research associate at the Institute for Women's Policy Research. As a national think tank, IWPR builds evidence to shape policies that empower women and improve the economic well-being of families. We are excited to share with you findings from our new briefing papers on the impact of the pandemic recession on young women's careers and economic, uh, and economic conditions. And we very much look forward to a discussion with our panelists on how public policies and job programs should support young women in achieving their goals while leveling the playing field by supporting those who have been hit the hardest by the pandemic recession. Let me share my screen first. Great. To start with, I would like to thank the Annie Casey Foundation for supporting our research on young women uh, workers, as well as Pivotal Ventures for supporting our survey data collection. A few quick, uh, a quick overview of today's agenda. We will be sharing some results from our June survey, uh, followed by inviting the panelists to share a little bit about their own experience and their organization's work and policy priorities relating to young women. And then we'll dive into a panel discussion on how public policies and job programs support young women in achieving their goals. Uh, we will introduce the panelists formally after the presentation. A few housekeeping items before we get started. The webinar will be recorded and will be made available on our website after the event. If you have questions for our panelists, please put them in the Q&A box by clicking the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen. We encourage you to use the chat to connect with other attendees during the webinar by using the chat button at the, uh, at the bottom of the screen. We ask that you uh, keep uh, the discussion, uh, keep all the discussion in the chat respectful and follow Zoom's community standards, which prohibits abuse and hateful conduct. We reserve, we reserve the right to remove individuals from the webinar if they violate these guidelines. You're welcome to introduce yourself there now. With that said, let's get started. As we all know, the COVID-19 pandemic has caused one of the worst economic downturns since the Great Depression. Women have experienced a disproportionate share of job losses. And as the pandemic continues, more women than men are dropping out of the workforce. IWPR's previous research has shown that young women are especially vulnerable to the pandemic recession but public policies have yet to fully address their needs. At the height of the pandemic recession, young women under the age of 25 lost more than a third of their jobs between February and April last year, a higher percentage of job loss than any other group. Heavy concentration in service and retail industries where job quality has been on the decline, undermined young women's economic security and rendered them vulnerable to economic downturns. How are young women, especially those who are socioeconomically disadvantaged, faring in the pandemic recession? In June 2021, IWPR fielded a nationally representative survey to capture young women's economic conditions and concerns as they navigate the pandemic. We collected a sample of more than 1,400 young women aged 18 to, 20, uh, to 34, with an oversample of Black and Latina women. Our survey also included questions about their gender identity and sexual orientation. Drawing from this unique data set, our new, our new survey briefs released today highlight some common challenges young women face during the COVID-19 crisis, as well as their diverse experience of economic hardship by race, ethnicity, level of education, gender identity, and sexual orientation. To get started um, on some specific findings, our survey shows a quarter of young women reported experiencing at least one career setback in the past year. And here, career setbacks include experiencing at least one of the following event, taking a job one didn't want just to pay the bills, taking an unpaid jobs or a job one didn't want just to gain work experience, postponing or giving up looking for a new job, or quitting one's job uh, due to an unsafe work environment. 
As you can see here, a higher share of young women of color and those identifying as gender non-conforming experience career setbacks. Young women of color were also much more likely than young white women to be looking for a new uh, to be looking for a different job. Uh, we interpret this pattern to mean different things. On the one hand, the pattern might reflect the fact that young Latina and Black women are much more likely to hold low-paying jobs with high turnover rates. And on the same time, at the same time, it might also reflect some optimism among young workers. Uh, given it's a worker's job market and they're looking for new opportunities to improve their uh, prospects. Severe job losses and high, turn, uh, high unemployment rates coupled with a lack of social safety net left many young women with little financial recourse during the pandemic. Our survey shows that um, uh, highlights the unequal experiences among different groups of young women as they navigate the recovery. Over half of all young women worry about paying their bills sometimes or almost daily. Young black and um, gender non-conforming women are especially worried compared to other groups. In results not shown, the same groups of young women who are social economically disadvantaged are also more likely to worry about the amount of debt they owe, losing their job or taking a pay cut. Facing financial insecurity, many have sought financial assistance from their parents, partners, relatives, and other people they know. Nearly a third of young women reported receiving uh, help paying their bills in the past year. Receiving financial assistance was most common among young Black and Latina women, and 43% um, and 42% respectively, compared to a quarter of young white women and women of other racial ethnic groups. The source of financial assistance among young women received um, varies across groups and reflects racial disparities in parental wealth. An overwhelming majority of young white women who received financial assistance during this time turned to their parents or in-laws, twice the share of young white women. In other words, um, young uh, many women of color and certain portion of young white women weren't able to rely uh, weren't able to access their um, access help through their parents. Despite these challenges, young women demonstrate tremendous resilience and optimism about their economic future. The traditional American dream with its connotations of upward social mobility and economic self-sufficiency remains appealing for many Americans. Our survey finds that despite economic hurdles posed by the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, many uh, four, more than four out of five young women believe that they have achieved or are, on, or are on their way towards achieving the American dream. But we also find that education shapes view on future opportunities. Those with higher level of education are more likely to feel they have already achieved or will achieve the American dream and less likely to say it's out of reach. In results not shown, when it comes to career goals, four out of five younger women who are currently employed report being very or somewhat satisfied with their chances for advancement in their jobs. And six out of 10 young women say they have already achieved their career goals or are optimistic about the, their ability to achieve them in the future. Young women not only have, fought, uh, have high aspirations, they overwhelmingly are in favor of structural policy changes that will help them achieve their goals. Nearly 80% of young women across racial ethnic groups and gender and sexual identities either somewhat or strongly support forgiving all student loan debt, raising the federal minimum wage, and guaranteeing childcare assistance to low income and middle class families. In conclusion, due to longstanding discriminatory policies and practices, young women of color and gender non-conforming women disproportionately carry the weight of student loans and low paid precarious work. Diverging economic realities among young women from different backgrounds underscore the need to focus on those who are let, being left further behind in this slow and uneven recovery. These insights must inform ongoing policy responses to support young women through the pandemic recession and beyond. Here we highlight a few policy responses that will help young women not just to recover from the pandemic, but to achieve economic security in the long term. And these policy include higher minimum wage and strengthening women's bar uh, workers' bargaining power, 
creating high quality jobs with decent pay, especially in sectors where, where young women are concentrated in. Creating pathways for young women to access high or middle skilled jobs in traditionally male dominated sectors. And that would also entail creating po uh, enforcing policies that tackle gender discrimination and gender segregation. In addition, we need universal health, uh, universal health care and a care infrastructure and reduce costs for higher education. Uh, we are welcome to check out um, more findings and interpretations for our two briefing papers released today. And here are the links. And with that said, let's turn to our panelists uh, and uh, panel discussion. We are very honored to introduce our panelists for today's discussion. Uh, first, we have Amanda, uh, Amanda Hans. After completing her degree from Texas A&M University, Amantha began her career in advertising as a digital marketing apprentice. She now leads the project management department for RCCO, an advertising uh, agency in San Antonio. Amantha also currently serves as a member of Young Invincibles Texas Apprenticeship Council, where she helps shape recommendations to, help, uh, to make apprenticeships more accessible and equitable for young people. Our next panelist is Felida Villarreal, who is currently the Deputy Executive Director of Valley Initiative for Development and Advancement based in Texas. Prior to this role, she served as Vida's Director of Finance. She has six years of accounting and financial management experience in the private sector. Felida holds a master's degree of accountancy from the University of Texas, Rio Grande Valley, and a bachelor's degree in business administration from the University of Texas, Pan American. Felida is very passionate about higher education attainment and expanding accessibility to equitable ec uh, education opportunities. She's also an advocate of women's empowerment initiatives to promote gender equality in the workplace and grow women's impact in leadership. Our next panelist is Jackie McGurn, who is a 34-year-old, seven-year carpenter with Local 327 in Boston. She's been a complete machine with more hours worked each year than most members. She's also the elected chair of the Boston Sisters in the Brotherhood Carpenters Women's Committee and is very active in her local. Finally, we have Lily Rocha, who is the Midwest Regional Director for Young Invincibles, where she leads a team to build policy and advocacy strategies specific to Illinois and engage young adults throughout the state. Lily has over a decade of experience in policy and advocacy. She spent almost four years on Capitol Hill as a congressional aide. After Congress, Lily's, uh, Lily joined an anti-sexual uh, anti Anti sexual assault organization where she led co a collaborative efforts with sexual assault survivors and state legislators to enact laws enhancing survivors' rights and, and eliminating the backlog of thousands of untested rape, uh, rape kits across the country. Prior to joining Young Invisibles, Lily was the chief of staff to a new millennial Illinois state representative. Lily received her BA in uh, economics and political science from Columbia University. And finally, my IWPR colleague, Jeff, uh, Jeff Hayes, and I will be moderating the panel discussion. I'll start sharing and proceed to the panel discussion. Great. Um, so uh, to start with, we uh, invite each panelist to share with us a, a little bit about your own experience during the pandemic or your journey up to this point um, or your the work or policy priorities of your organization pertaining to young women's career aspects. Um, and at the same time, we invite our audience to put your questions for our panelists in the Q&A box. Would any of our panelists um, like to start? Hi, this is uh, Falida. I can go ahead and um, start on that first question. Um, 
Regarding pandemic and also prior to pandemic, I think young women faced a multitude of struggles and challenges in the workforce. Um, I think many for the for many years, I mean, we've uh, tried to fight for an impact and an influence in, in the workforce and to be able to have, you know, a voice in leadership roles. And I think that when the pandemic hit and throughout this COVID recovery time period, that's just kind of um, caused some regression to some of that movement that we've achieved. Because during pandemic, a lot of young females were faced with the decision of, you know, choosing between their career or, you know, being at home because they're, you know, student parents or they need to, they needed to provide childcare for their um, kids or their families. And, you know, with the COVID and the, uh, the closing of a lot of schools, of daycares, you know, that really impacted the young woman um, population. And according to the Bureau of Labor Statistics, about 3 million women have left the workforce since the start of the coronavirus pandemic in 2020. And I think, you know, moving forward as a community, if we want to advance and, you know, recover from the COVID-19 and promote socioeconomic growth, I think it's critical that we um, bring and ensure that we bring back these 3 million women back into the workforce because they are a huge representation of the workforce across various industries. Um, but in addition to that, I also think that COVID-19 exposed a lot of underrepresentation in certain industries and sectors. I mean, we saw with, you know, a lot of business closures that, you know, the service industry and retail really got hurt and declined because of COVID and a lot of other industries boomed relating, you know, to STEM related careers technology, the skilled trades, you know, such as, you know, commercial electricians, commercial welders and stuff like that. And those are industries where traditionally women do not have a presence. So I think it's very important that going forward, we create, you know, this awareness and the support on, you know, perhaps upskilling or in retraining young women to fit the needs of our current industry needs. Fantastic, Felina. Thank you for, um, you know, you're sharing that and it's absolutely uh, really essential as you mentioned for uh, young women to access these new opportunities being opened up. And I think that's really related to Lita's work and perhaps could you maybe share with the audience what kind of work that Vida is, has been doing uh, with young women and you know, in helping them upscaling their skills and accessing new opportunities. Definitely. So Vida is a nonprofit organization. We are located in the Rio Grande Valley. And for those of you not familiar with the Rio Grande Valley, it is a border region between Texas and uh, Mexico. It is in the southern tip of Texas. And we are still, you know, in the MSA with the highest poverty rate in the nation. So our um, population is a very unique demographic population that not only faces socioeconomic barriers, but there's language barriers, there's social barriers, because a lot of the times our students are first time generation college students, so they don't have a strong support system at home. So there's countless challenges and barriers that they face from continuing and furthering their education. So VIDA comes in and provides financial assistance for career training programs to make sure that they succeed long term in a career pathway. Um, but in addition to that, VIDA provides intensive case management services for our students, which is really the core success of our students. Um, VIDA students have an average of 93% persistence rate as opposed to the average 50% at the college level. So 93% of our students persist semester to semester and successfully complete their degree or their industry certification because we have our counselors that are assigned to these students and that meet with them on a weekly basis, on a monthly basis to make sure that you know they stay motivated, that they stay encouraged and that we can provide them with all the available resources and tools to ensure their academic success. Um, we do serve roughly 500 students a year. 
Um, but in 2021, actually 62% of our students were young females. So that continues to be, you know, a very important um, population that we serve in the Rio Grande Valley. That's great. And we do have some questions later about uh, specific successful examples of job training programs or partnerships on the local level. And we'll be happy to learn more about the work uh, at VITA. Um, and so we can, uh, I guess, since you uh, already dealt into the first questions, I think we can sort of all chime in and combining, uh, you know, through your own experience or through the experience of young women you work with, what are some of the challenges they face in meeting their career goals before or during the pandemic? And how has the pandemic and the recession uh, further um, impacted them, especially those who are socioeconomically disadvantaged? Um, and also you can, you're welcome to share your own experience or um, the work that your organization are doing uh, while answering this question. Sure, I can jump in everyone. Hi, my name is Lily Rocha, Midwest Regional Director for Young Invincibles. Um, for those of us um, unfamiliar with us, we are a, a nonprofit advocacy organization headquartered in DC um, where we do policy advocacy on a federal level, but then we also have state offices where we work um, on our three buckets of work, uh, healthcare, workforce development, and higher education on a state level. Um, one of them, of course, being here in Illinois. And so um, I work with my team really here in Illinois on more state level advocacy for young adults ages 18 to 34, um, again, in those three buckets of work. And, you know, again, to uh, Felida's point, it's really just been about uh, looking at how the COVID has exacerbated a lot of existing inequalities. A lot of this isn't exactly new or surprising or shocking to us, um, but it is uh, dramatic and it is unprecedented. So it does require for us, at least in her policy advocacy perspective, a lot of investments, uh, continued investments really from the federal and for us with the state government. So what we've been doing is really a couple different things. We've been doing some legislative advocacy um, on basic supports. Um, and so whether that's, you know, folks who go to college um, and also young workers who are trying to get a job and also keep a job. And what we found is that one, um, uh, support that's gravely needed, and I'm sure this is no surprise, is uh, child care. And so we started looking at how that impacts um, students who are parents and going um, to school, having a disruption from COVID and then being able to go back to school. Um, so we started trying to identify some data in Illinois and to our surprise, we really couldn't find much. So we went to a few state agencies, worked with a lot of advocates like Women Employed and Ready Nation here in Illinois who do fantastic work and um, you know, kind of asked like, where's this data? And turns out we didn't really have it. So. We worked with them last legislative sessions, which our sessions run January um, through May. So this spring in, in 2021, worked with them on passing legislation that would require institutions to collect data about student parents. Because from what we know at the national level, it tends to be black and brown women who tend to be the caretakers of children, who tend to be the students that need that specific support. So for us, it's really imperative that we craft policies that fit our state um, and really can't do that without data. And so I really wanna make sure that we're getting part of that data collection. And then I think the next step will be working with our partners um, in the state agencies like the Illinois Board of Higher Education and you know other folks um, making sure to you know identify solutions because some of the things do work. Um, and so we wanna uplift that and then we wanna keep going. Um, but of course that requires investments, right? And so in our other workforce kind of work, um, one thing that we've also seen there is that workers, particularly women, do need childcare, especially we saw so many of them exiting the workforce that we've mentioned um, due to their inability to um, find care, pay for care, or you know, just kind of be able to have that support. And so we've been, um, you know, asking the federal government, we've been asking the state government to really make those investments in specific programs that subsidize child care, for, ex um, for example, and then also being able to start having the conversations for long-term investments. So our, I think our um, 
are, you know, we, we were really excited as, as I'm sure a lot of people were to see a lot of federal cash coming down to the states and be like, oh, great, we can use these for a lot of things. We saw it go to a lot of job training programs. We saw it go to some apprenticeship programs here in Illinois. So we're thrilled. Um, I think our fight now is just making sure that there's sustained investment. And so in Illinois, that's a fight. Um, we don't have um, the best <laughs> fiscal outlook, um, but it is something that I know um, is, is headed in the right direction. And so really looking forward to working with folks. And um, I, I, what we've done too is we've done a lot of surveys, um, focus groups and uh, young advocate trainings to get people on the ground to help us understand what's going on. So for example, we did a focus group just on like workforce issues and what some of the issues are. Um, and one thing that we heard um, is that they just don't understand, especially for a lot of people that are coming from like first generation and immigrant backgrounds, just how to manage their finances, how to fill out task, task, tax forms, sorry. Um, and it, it's not something that we believe is a cure-all, right? Financial literacy is, 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 is part of the solution, but we do recognize that coming from our constituency, that's what we heard. So then we worked on a bill um, to get the Office of the Comptroller here in Illinois to start um, a task force identifying some of those needs. And so we um, are part of that work now when we surveyed young adults in Illinois and found that, um, yeah, there's there's a great need for understanding finances and how they work, filling out taxes, planning for retirement, a lot of those forms that you sign onboarding and you don't know what they mean. Um, and so, again, kind of like our work, how does it come from there? And we're also working on a Young Workers Bill of Rights um, and kind of looking at like, what are the rights that young workers should have and um, where do we see them coming in? So we've been doing a, a strong push and trying to identify what those measures are. And so we had our Young Advocates Program, which is like a training program for 12 weeks, come together and work on this with us. Um, and what was great is they were able to provide their own experiences. They're like, yeah, you know, when I worked in, in retail, I didn't have a consistent schedule. I was unable to take paid leave and now I'm an essential worker and I'm supposed to go and I don't have paid leave. So a lot of these issues, again, were just exacerbated by COVID and have a COVID lens. So what does it mean when you don't have paid leave, but you need to take the shot, right, the vaccine? Um, so we're excited to continue working with our legislative partners, continue to uplifting the voices of young adults, making sure that they're at the forefront of any legislative advocacy um, campaigns. But yeah, thanks. Fantastic. Thank you, Lily, so much. Um, you covered a lot of grounds uh, in, you know, introducing the work of you do and on multiple levels with, you know, working with state legis legislatures, policies, employers. Uh, campuses, right? What does it mean to have a high quality job and the importance of student parents and also the importance of advocacy? And uh, so I will hope to learn more about the specific examples in, in Illinois and the work that you do as we delve into some of these uh, questions later. Um, thank you. And I want to give it a chance for the other, uh, for Amantha and Jackie to chime in too. Yeah, um, I was going to say we're seeing similar um, I think with lack of access and visibility and resources um, in the research that is being done in Texas. Um, ours is the research I'm looking at is more specific to apprenticeships um, in general, but 75% um, of the women they surveyed were interested in earn and learn opportunities like apprenticeships, um, but 68% cited the cost of tuition as an obstacle, 43% cite family care as an obstacle. Um, there's issues like finding the right program or knowing what's available. Um, and then, you know, gender stereotypes and bias, especially in skilled trades. I'm sure, I'm sure that's something that Jackie is more familiar with, but um, I wanted to share a quote that one of my fellow council members um, shared with us. Um, she said that she thinks most women don't realize this is even a career path um, because it's always traditionally been a man's job. Um, I thought that was especially impactful, you know, that something you know, these are really high earning careers, really successful careers, and they don't even know it's an option. Um, and if it is an option, they don't know where to find it or find access to it. So um, I think I thought that was pretty interesting. Great, right. and talking about um, women in traditionally male dominated fields, uh, I, I wanna, Jackie, you wanna share some of your experience or the work that you've been doing locally uh, with your union and um, your committee work. 
Absolutely. Um, so I'm out of uh, Boston, Massachusetts. And one of the main concerns I'm going to piggyback off of Lily would be the child care. So prior to COVID, um, Liz Skidmore was kind of a front runner on our program that we were implementing, which was child care that works because we realized that our schedules are much earlier than the traditional nine to five job. So having early child care was a, a big problem for a lot of women. Like that was their main concern of getting into the union. What am I going to do with my children? They're young. And how do I get started with this career and, and really putting time and effort into something that's so important to the community? Um, we started it, but then COVID and the pandemic kind of happened. It kind of halted and, and put a, like a lull on all of that. But then since the, um, since the world's been back open and running, uh, the program is up and running. We have a few families that have been placed, men and women, but mainly women um, have been placed with the earlier child care. So now they're open from uh, five in the morning. So you can drop your child off on your way to work and get to work on time. Um, and then the other thing um, that a problem that we've had just being a woman in the field is the training and the support. So for us, like we're built different, our bodies are built different. So um, like, traditionally like a man is taller and maybe stronger or can lift things differently it's not that we can't do it it's just being shown how to do it the way um, our physical uh, attributes are but everybody else probably pretty much covered everything else um, in terms of that first question all right fantastic and thank you so much and talk had definitely stood out as um, an important issue and um, and in thinking about what you know, high quality jobs to support young women have. We'd like to, the next question we have is to delve deeper into what kind of federal or state level policies that can be leveraged to promote creating these support, uh, creating high, level, uh, high quality jobs and access to higher education and inclusion uh, in occupations um, for, for young women. If, if you have more to share within your specific, uh, your local and state level landscape. I think more um, more policies toward you know job training programs and you know human capital investment is critical, especially during these times of recovery, because there is a lot of opportunity for retraining and upskilling, um, especially you know with technology how it's been advancing and more even more so during the pandemic where we saw you know a big significant transition to online and to a virtual environment, both in the workforce and in the academic setting. So there's a lot of new um, training career pathways available in those fields, you know, such as IT, um, cybersecurity, that prior might have already um, existed, but not as, you know, to the um, level of importance that it is now coming out of the pandemic. And I think, um, you know, in addition to that, you know, just targeting young women and I think the current, you know, um, presidential administration that we have, you know, has also focused on programs such as, you know, universal pre-K and, you know, a cap on childcare costs depending on household income. So I think policies and, and strategies that, you know, target these obstacles that young women face going forward is very important. And also, you know, to um, increase resources for funding job training. Great, thank you. Does anyone have else, anything else to add? So for in Massachusetts, we have a PGTI, which is a policy group on tradeswomen issues. And they kind of cover a lot of that for us, which is wonderful because they make the contractors um, withhold a standard of 20% women hours um, per job. So they kind of enforce that and have our backs on that. And also Building Pathways is a good program that we have implemented here in Boston um, for helping women get into the field and kind of give them that um, understanding of different like do's and don'ts of things that happen on the job and what to look out for. And, uh, I think those are good allies to have. And I think um, if there's weaker spots in the United States that need help with that, they need to implement some sort of program like that. 
Yeah, thank you. And, you know, as we're watching, uh, you know, the investments commitment made by the new administration in the Build Back Better plan, I think a big question is how do we ensure that the funds getting to these programs and uh, realizing the, the importance of them for supporting women workers. Um, so thank you for sharing those examples. Um, so other than policies, uh, we talked about job training programs. Uh, the next set of questions we have are about could you, based on the work of your organization or other programs you know, what are some local successful examples of job training programs or public-private partnerships that support young women in getting the skills they need um, and accessing high-quality jobs in education? Uh, what are the, some of the challenges? You can also share some of the challenges in implementing these programs and making sure they meet the needs of young women today. And as uh, Felita talked about, especially in a moment when many are rethinking their careers and uh, seeking opportunities for retraining. I think uh, one thing for us that, you know, we've worked um, a bit in technical assistance with um, some state programs and in, in, in job training and apprenticeships specifically. Um, and, uh, you know, our part of our goal, we released a report in July 2020 looking at the need for increasing diversity in terms of gender and race in, um, in apprenticeships, you know, just talking about what Amantha was talking about, you know, it's uh, a lot of uh, just women, young women, in particular, and young women of color don't even know these are options or don't feel like it's for them or are kind of told it's not for them, right? Um, so one thing that we um, worked with is with some employers and trying to help them think like, how would an apprenticeship program look like. And I think one of the um, constant challenges that we faced was just having employers not think of uh, training as like a, a time suck for them and making sure that they understand that it really is an investment. Um, and then thinking through how, you know, it is, it could be, you know, a bit challenging at first to set up a formal training program, right? From an employer standpoint, it does require resources and planning and staff and all of that. But I think once we were able to demonstrate to them the value and seeing how not, not just from the perspective that we know that, you know, these women tend to get um, higher earning jobs and tend to have like just increased uh, economic, uh, um, economic, um, you know, prosperity throughout their lifetimes. It was really also kind of telling the employers like, look, you tend to get more engaged um, folks. You tend to retain people longer. You tend to get, um, you know, skilled expertise in areas that you wouldn't thought about. You get to diversify your workplace. Um, and so we know that's something that a lot of companies are thinking about now. And I think, you know, we, when we did this two years ago, it was on the radar, but I think now, especially kind of talking to employers about how that really helps them, I think um, it helps sells it to them. But yeah, definitely, you know, working with employers um, and, and trying to set up an apprenticeship program sometimes is difficult. It could be a bit of the mindset challenge. It could be just a resource challenge or a combination. Um, but I think it really helps having, you know, strong advocates and good partners at state agencies, you know, and other places um, that you can come in and be like, well, we can help you. We can make this happen. Thank you. Um, yeah, I'll let Amanda chime in. Yeah, um, so I was actually a former apprentice as well um, in digital marketing, which I know is kind of a unique field for an apprenticeship program. Um, so I kind of wanted to give a shout out to um, my apprenticeship program. It's called New Apprenticeship here um, in San Antonio and Austin. Um, so they work um, as an independent company um, and they facilitate all the training and help you get in with a company in the field um, and I was just looking at their website and they have 54% uh, of their apprentices are women in tech and digital marketing. Um, and 75% are underrepresented minorities in tech. Um, so I think, you know, uh, you know, piggybacking off of what Lily said, like apprenticeship programs are huge. Um, and I think can really make a difference. I mean, it's made a difference in my life personally. Um, but uh, yeah, I think, getting more people involved in apprenticeships and, and spreading the word about those and, and making them a lot more accessible, um, you know, in different, with different policies and stuff, I think is, is gonna be, make a huge difference in a lot of lives. Um, there's a couple others too, um, just on the council alone that I'm on, um, a couple examples like um, Bombardier Aviation, um, Skill Point Alliance does like skilled trades and manufacturing, um, the Electrical and Safety of Texas Association. There's a bunch of different um, 
like lots of different kinds of apprenticeships out there. So I think just making sure that those are available and accessible and, you know, people know that anyone can do them, I think uh, is, is really important. And thank you, Amanda and Lily. Um, and while you were talking about making them accessible uh, and inclusive, could you talk more about the challenges of how they haven't been, or why they haven't been accessible and how to, what kind of support, you know, what kind of role that the government and the employers and the job training programs can play to make them more accessible to, to young women from, or young workers from different backgrounds? Yeah, one of the things that came up a lot um, that we were talking about at the council is we just didn't know they were where to find them. Um, there's not really a, a central place. There's no like job board or something like that for apprenticeships with all that information about what they are. Um, I think especially in fields like digital marketing and tech and, and business and those kind of things where it's not as common of, of a career path. Um, we talked about like the ideas of, of, you know, creating some sort of central place with all that information or, you know, getting in at high school or at the college level with, you know, mentorship or, you know, someone to kind of walk you through the options you have. Um, and then I think um, like some of the other things that came up a lot is like childcare being an option, um, especially, you know, uh, uh, affordable childcare or even free childcare, healthcare um, being made available. Um, and another thing like pay transparency and more information about like where career trajectory could go um, really helps women make really informed decisions about like, okay, this is the right move for me. This is something I want to you know move forward with. I think we're just missing a lot of the information. The programs are out there. It's just, we're not connecting with the right people, it seems like. Yeah, I mean, one thing, um, and I'm happy to share a report too, but, you know, a couple of things that we saw is similar to what Amantha was saying is, is just in, increased supports um, to some ways to get folks in there. And we know that, you know, deliberately or not, you know, um, certain folks like women and people of color have been excluded from some of these pathways. So it, it makes sense that they have a difficult time finding them. So one thing that we, um, recommended was really um, investing in um, a, a navigators or, um, you know, different um, outreach and recruitment uh, folks that can go out there um, to different communities and be able to um, educate the communities and the public about the internship opportunities and the programs so that the onus doesn't completely fall um, totally on, on the worker to find that resource that they don't even know exists. Um, so making sure that that's there is really important. Um, and then making sure that they are, um, you know, connecting directly, very specifically with the clients about what the opportunities are and being, being very clear. Um, I think that sometimes people, you know, if they haven't heard of it and they all of a sudden hear about it, they may be like, what does it mean? How much am I going to get paid? And just being very clear and um, demonstrative of the, of the benefits that are available. And again, that requires investments in, in staff and time. Um, the other thing is just uh, the creation of a job barrier reduction fund. So here in Illinois, we um, did have one for a few years um, and, uh, you know, with state funding and I believe it was 2015, 2016, it was when it, it kind of froze um, because of the lack of, of some state funding. And so uh, this year we did get um, through COVID relief dollars, we were able to get some um, some new injection into that fund. Um, and so helping folks get, you know, think about transportation and childcare and housing and all the other things that also have to happen outside of your life for you to be able to have a job and secure a job um, or an apprenticeship. And so, um, you know, making sure that that's there is, is really critical because again, we kind of think of, you know, um, folks as like, oh, they got the job, they're good, they're ready. And it's like, no, they're still struggling to, to get to work every day. They're still trying to find childcare or they're still, you know, trying to figure out where they're gonna live um, long-term. And so um, doing that is gonna be great. And the last thing that we recommended too is, um, creating some equity targets and I know our state has been um, you know making some headway on, on, on a lot of these issues but just making sure that we have some sort of measurable progress on a lot of apprenticeships that also puts some of the onus and the accountability on um, the state and state partners and you know the private sector as well um, 
to make sure that we're, we're reaching out to uh, women and people of color um, for apprenticeship programs, but I think also just job training programs and, you know, um, those types of endeavors as well. Could I um, throw in a couple questions that we've gotten through the audience, Shengwei? Great. Okay. Uh, I, I think b before that, I, I just wonder, on, on the same question about job training, would either Felida or uh, Jackie has anything to add before we move on? Sure. Um, I would just like to add that, you know, in here in the Rio Grande Valley, um, we've really tried to strengthen the partnerships between the institutions of higher education and also the relationships with industry and employers. Because a lot of time the curriculum for these apprenticeships or curriculum for job training in general is not aligned with what the workforce needs or what that specialized skill requires. So when you have these partnerships and that communication, it's very helpful. But in addition to that, you know, I've noticed firsthand that employers have taken more of an, an active role in job training and in developing these apprenticeships. Um, I can tell you that here in the Rio Grande Valley, there is a network of private hospitals that is actually now looking into developing their own division for employee development and training so that that would, um, you know, address a lot of the barriers of, you know, scheduling, for the um, for the employees, because the training will be housed, you know, internally at in, in their job site, and they're also looking into facilitating, you know, childcare within the workplace as well. So I think going forward, you know, this trend of employers, you know, taking this active role is going to be very important. Thank you very much, Lila. It actually leads me to uh, into the next question. But before we go into Q and A uh, questions, is that what roles can employer play to promote uh, access and uh, to training and high quality jobs? And you touched, uh, you mentioned the importance of that. And uh, I'm just wondering if other panelists have anything to say about the role of employers. Um, I know that Lily you mentioned uh, that convincing employers to uh, about the importance of apprenticeship um, for the long-term uh, view and just wondering if other panelists have anything to add on the role of employers. Um, or, one thing I yeah. wanted to highlight was um, mentorship too is um, one thing that really came up with us um, and whether that's through the apprenticeship or through the employer, um, giving women an opportunity to kind of talk to someone, whether it's a peer or someone else in the industry or a supervisor or someone um, to just kind of help guide them along their path and really get those questions answered and make sure that they're making the right steps and, and they're, they're feeling really confident in their careers and they know, you know where to find information, where to, how to ask the right questions, how to be more successful um, within their jobs. And then one thing that I've kind of personally noticed with um, within my company and with the people I work for, with, um, I think not only the access to the affordable healthcare and childcare, but the flexibility of, you know, being able to work remote or work from home because the kid is sick and you can't take them to daycare that day, or, you know, be able to come in some days or, you know, it depends. I mean, it really depends on your field. Obviously I'm from a more of a desk job. Um, so this is not necessarily the same as, you know, some of the different careers, but I think the idea of flexibility um, from an employer, um, especially the way things have changed, um, getting women back in the workforce, um, they need to be really flexible about paid leave, work schedules, and um, just really be mindful of, of who you've got on your team and what they need to be successful. Thank you. Um, and finally, does, does Jackie, do you have anything to add, say about employer's role? Um, I think Amanda really touched a lot of bases on them being mindful of the, who, the, who they have working for them. And I think that's really important, especially with the, you know, higher presence of women just in the field um, that th our needs might be a little bit different at this time, um, the way the economy is and just the way the world is running. Uh, that's about it. Thank you. All right, shall we go to Q&A, Jeff? Sure, one of the questions that came in was kind of related to the um, 
the job training programs in the sense of do any of your organizations or have you have any sort of best practices around how you do outreach to younger women, even, you know, then actually probably eligible for the training programs, but how you get people interested in non-traditional careers and um, at earlier ages, any sort of, that was the question that came in. So for us here in Boston, we have, um, we do a lot of like career days at the high schools and the trade schools. And we have a panel of women come whether it's you know carpenters to electricians to plumbers, all different in the field, um, to explain what it's like to be in the field, what we do on a day-to-day -day basis, and just talk to younger children. So it's more just a face-to-face -to, -face, um, to try to educate them on what our career, how it's important to us, um, you know how proud we are of the things that we built, and then some of the different trades do um, different, you know like little tasks. Like we would have a drywall board and the students would get their hands on a drywall gun and get to screw it into the wall to try to get them excited about, you know, being in the field. Oh man, if I had that in school, I would definitely be in carpentry. That sounds so fun. <laughs> I think one thing we've seen for us is just the importance of networks. Um, so again, we have a um, you know young advocates program, which we, we train young adults um, for about 12 weeks on leadership advocacy skills and have uh, projects for them to work on. But um, we've seen just how leveraging the, that network and sh having that share with their friends, having them share with their friends, friends, it really does um, spread things around versus coming from, you know, an email from an organization where they might just like not read it or, you know, especially uh, we've noticed with Gen Z, they're not, they, they don't love email. So <laughs> trying to figure out other ways to get around them, it really is like word of mouth still is a time tested way to, to get folks there. So um, I think just leveraging our young um, advocates network and just our YI network in general and getting information to them directly from me versus a newsletter from the organization is something that we've been trying to get better at. So for us, it's very similar to um, we really try our best to stay involved within the community. So we do um, try our very best to have a presence at the local colleges and the local university. That way, our counselors can have, you know, direct one-to-one um, -one communication and contact with our potential um, students, whether it be current or future students. And I think during these times also, um, we've really tried to invest in um, social media marketing, as well as, you know, online digitalization that's becoming more and more prominent in um, the times that we're living in and the virtual environment. So that has also been a useful tool for us when it comes to outreach. That's great. Uh, and thank you all for your input. Um, we, we have a few more minutes and I'd like to get into the question about advocacy and organizing in how to raise, uh, to, you know, raise awareness around some of the issues that you touched upon today. So could you maybe share us either with the organization you, you work at or examples that you see, share with a little about the advocacy or organizing efforts that took place um, to advocate for more support for young workers and what are some promising strategies or examples moving forward? Hi, so we have the Sisters in the Brotherhood, which is a community of women that work in the carpenter um, trade. And they, we have about 20 to 30 women come to a meeting once a month and they can share their feelings. It's kind of a safe spot for them to, you know, explain their day to day or something that might be bothering them on the job. And I think just having that outlet helps um, them feel like they're not alone in the field and that they can make a friend. Cause a lot of struggles that we have in the field is that I, I'm the only female that works for my company. So I don't have a female to kind of bounce something off of or, or just have an ear to talk to for the day. So um, I can always pick up the phone and talk to a sister that I met at the meeting that I've created a bond with through that group. So I think that having the sisters in the brotherhood is um, very detrimental, especially during the pandemic to just check in with each other 
and make sure that um, we're all, you know, mind, body, and soul doing very well for ourselves. So um, through that, I think that it's very successful and we're going to continue to do it. Sounds great. Thank you. We've seen short a story. Oh, go ahead. No, go ahead. Go ahead. Um, just real quickly, we've seen um, sharing personal stories and anecdotes with legislators be particularly impactful. And so, um, you know, when we're talking about uh, you know creating systemic uh, or addressing systemic issues, we really need the people who are affected at, by it at the table uh, where decisions are being met made. But uh, one of the problems is that sometimes you know these communities tend to lack. Um, either the knowledge of how to go about talking to your legislator or the confidence to do so. Um, and I know that I did before I worked in this work, you know, coming from like a Mexican um, immigrant family, first generation, I just never imagined myself being able to just go to my state senator and talk about funding for job training programs or, or college scholarships. And so um, I think one of the things for us too is being able to train people to be their own best advocates and, and kind of being able to share their story. So, you know, what makes how, how what makes for an effective story? Um, how, like you're in control of your story. When do you share it? When do you not? Like, how do you check in with yourself? How do you check in with others? And really being able to just, um, have legislators and uh, you know folks hear from uh, the people who are impacted by this is extremely powerful, and I wouldn't um, ever uh, you know underestimate the power of that, and encourage advocates as well to to really make sure that you're training folks to to be confident um, in reaching out to decision makers and being able to talk to them themselves. So for Vida, Vida was found actually more than 25 years ago by Valley Interfaith. Valley Interfaith is a community organization that um, initiates a lot of organizing efforts to push policy and, you know, um, strategies depending on, you know, current circumstances and, and current needs of our community. And they continue to play a very important role here in our community and, you know, hold these organizing efforts and these workshops where we also um, continue to try to be involved. And during these type of, you know, conferences and workshops, you know, it's very powerful to have, you know, inspiring speakers speakers and uh, young, especially young women that have gone through job training and have a successful story of a successful career path, because that really, you know, encourages and motivates, you know, the other young women of our community to, you know, make those decisions on improving their quality of life and, you know, advancing not only for their families and for themselves, but also for the overall growth of our community. I think, you know, if we continue to bring more of this awareness and more support, um, then more young women will see, you know, education as a tool to improve their quality of life and, you know, for overall long-term success. Thank you. I like how you both um, emphasized it's training young uh, workers or young adults to be advocates kids for themselves, but not just for themselves, it's also for the community uh, as well being. So uh, with that, I think we're almost at time. Are there any lingering comments that you would like to share regarding either advocacy or anything we talked about today? Um, all right, and I think we, we're one minute away. Could you maybe very briefly, we'll conclude with this final question, very briefly share, what are your biggest hope for the future for young women, um, if you're able to keep it short? I'll go first. Um, for me, my biggest hope for young women would be to um, just have the opportunity to do things that they didn't know that they were capable of doing. And hopefully, um, getting that out there that they can and just creating the bonds that I've created throughout my career. Um, I wouldn't have made it as far as I have if it wasn't for like Ryle Rhodes, Liz Skidmore, uh, Hugh Nguyen. So I, hopefully younger women can do that as well. Thank you. Would any other panelists would like to chime in? I think I would say the same thing, um, that they can do anything they want. It doesn't matter who they are or where they are or what their background is. If they want to do it, they, they should be able to do it. 
Yeah, and I hope that they recognize that, you know, sometimes it, even if they can't, it's it, it's not them. Sometimes it is systemic. And so, um, you know, to, to keep finding community because um, there's a lot of us out here um, trying to improve the law for, for our generation and future generations. So, um, you know, find, find your community, find your tribe. Yeah, I agree also. I think, you know, for me, it would be, you know, that I hope that we can continue to inspire these young women to pursue a career and, you know, to do something that they feel passionate about. And at the end of the day, to have an impact in on their life, but also on the community that, that they live in and to have an expanded influence and presence in community and, um, you know, policy making and you know, being that voice for the young women that we continue to fight for because we are, you know, unfortunately still underrepresented, underrepresented in certain um, sectors and certain industry. But, you know, I think if we continue in, in the right direction and continue using the resources that we have available to ourselves that, you know, any young woman has the opportunity and the capability to succeed and to pursue a successful career. All right, thank you all so much. And definitely we, you know, in order to, for young women to achieve that, we need uh, support from every level, from the policies, from employers, from the training, and also providing more resources for advocacy and empowerment. So uh, we learned so much from each of you, your, your sharing. And um, so thank you again for uh, being here, pan the panelists, and thank you to the audience for uh, joining us uh, at this, webinar. We'll be posting our recording on our website so we can go uh, back to what we discussed. And again, thank you all for joining us. And we hope to build a future for young women together. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you for having us.